Dr. Marquides arrived in Japan just about a month ago um, at OIST and uh, is hitting uh, the ground running. And we're very excited to learn about, uh, you know, uh, some of your views um, and your experiences uh, of the role of universities in the 21st century. So thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. And uh, I'm so thrilled to be here also. You should know that. And, uh, and also, my first two days, I started the 1st of June, and my first two days, I, we had a, a typhoon coming over us. And that was, uh, I don't know how I should kind of interpret that. But uh, I think it's always good to have the Greek gods with you. Huh? Yeah. So uh, we, I hope that's a good sign. So uh, yes, I want to present a little bit of myself first, and then go into some uh, questions how I look upon uh, uh, this. Uh, big uh, responsibility that is uh, on on all of us here. So, um, so yes, I will move this forward. You can see now on the slide um, a map of the world, and you can also see my academic homes that I have been uh, at. So first of all, I want to explain that I, I see universities as a stakeholder that is actually connected in, in the global world. Uh, and it's very open in the global world. And of course, also, it, ha it has locations in the local settings. And uh, these, these two uh, uh, characteristics of a university is very important. And I will come back to that. But here first, uh, to take a, a worldview. So of course, as, as a researcher, you don't really know this uh, kind of journey beforehand where you're going to end up. But um, you know, it's, in my uh, case, I started over there. You can see Stockholm University up here. And, and that is a young, pretty young and, and a kind of outreaching uh, university in natural science. Uh, focused in Stockholm, and there's, that's where I started, and I got my PhD there. And I started with math and geography and, and natural geography and, and geology and all these type of things, uh, sustainability things. But then I thought, I really figured out that analytical chemistry is really um, a, a discipline that really gives you an opportunity to look at uh, science and knowledge in a systemic way. And I say that because that has been kind of a uh, red line through but my whole um, career and also something that really, really fascinates me that uh, the curiosity uh, that we are driven by in universities that is really co should be connected also to a systemic view uh, in addition to the focus that we, we need to have to move the knowledge forward. So, OK, so from, uh, from uh, that, uh, you can see number two. Where is that? Yeah, it's over on this other side. Uh, I actually uh, took, uh, went over to Utah and to the Mormon uh, community. Uh, I was very, uh, you can imagine, I was very unique there. So, uh, so uh, I was the only female, only non-Mormon, only European. And, uh, and about the university um, is really, I was in the Wild West, yes, but it was really a university that I ta taught me a lot about innovation. I mean, as you know, uh, they, uh, the Mormons are super good in long-term thinking and innovation and how to collaborate. So I learned a lot about those things there. So, so after I took my tenure there, I um, actually went back to Sweden and to Uppsala, uh, now to another third type, because BYU was private, of course. And, and, um, and Uppsala University is, is public, and it's really a huge uh, university, very old, very old and traditional. So I really got into that kind of life. And there I became professor in chemistry and also dean of chemistry. And, and uh, we, it was a, a very... Uh, very, very important time for me to understand really the uh, the whole history of uh, and where we are in university settings and the challenges we have. And so after that, I felt that I needed to do something about this because my three experiences of universities in the Western world, all three of them, they were so different. And I thought, how in the world can we, uh, to the society outside of universities, have any kind of a message together? 
we are so different. So then I thought I wanted to work uh, for a few years uh, for the Vinova, which is not on this map here, because it's, um, uh, I was a director general for the, the Swedish Agency for Innovation for a couple of years, just to understand, uh, see, to, I put myself outside of the box to see what, in the, what is going on. After that, I actually got recruited to become a president of the only private university in Northern Europe, which you see down here, Chalmers. And Chalmers University of Technology is um, uh, really, it's a private and public. It has uh, about 40 daughter companies and it has the best uh, innovation air, um, uh, processes in uh, universities in Northern Europe, I would claim. Uh, and so it was a very rich environment. Um, I, I even was a, a chairman of building a, a <laughs> of, uh, properties, uh, you know, developing science parks and so forth, test beds, you name it, living labs. I learned a lot there. And there I actually also started to work together with um, uh, other universities in the world, like Tokyo University, mm. because uh, Komiyama was president at the same time, and we became good friends, and we started to work in the Alliance for Global Sustainability. Uh, I was actually also invited by um, uh, Omisan when to come over and be part of the SDS forum. Uh, so it was uh, where I started to really work uh, more closely with Japan in different ways. And then uh, after, I also were, started to um, work with California at that time. I became guest professor at Stanford um, over a couple of years there. I was going back and forth. After, um, after 14 years, actually, in, in Uppsala, I, um, I, dis and I decided to um, um, do some, uh, to look around in the world if I could actually uh, get more, add more of the, this knowledge to my portfolio of it, my interest for what is a university really. So then uh, I ended up in a university called AUA, Armenian University, uh, American University of Armenia. And it is, as you see, connected both to University of California and to Armenia. Uh, this was, uh, of course, added on a lot of knowledge about um, post-Sovietic type of situation for a little country what I would like to be in the free world uh, and all the struggles with that. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, uh, you know, there are not many other universities in the world that you could, um, yeah, I have to mention this one also. I became chairman of, uh, of the, the Danish largest technical university, uh, and I'm still, I'm still chairman of that university, and I think we should take advantage of that if we could. So I, that's an uh, open uh, invitation for you all, because I will be stay, still stay on uh, one and a half year more as chairman of that university, very, I, I just want to say one word about it because it's, um, it's connected to uh, 15 years ago, the Danish uh, government, which are doing many funny things. We can talk about that another time. But, <laughs> but they decided to suddenly to put all the institutes, research institutes into the universities, mm. which was a shock for the system. Uh, but 15 years later, it's a, a very strong advantage that they have there. So, and of course, the next door is Novo Nordisk, and you can understand that it's an interesting situation. Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, after that, what, what else is there that you could uh, ach try to, you know, achieve? Yes, of course. When the opening at OIST came up, I, oh, I followed the development all the way since I first met uh, um, um, Omisan, I was really intrigued about what's going on and what his ideas and everything. So I've been following it. And then when that opening was there, of course, it was uh, for me, uh, as you can understand now, uh, a, a perfect fit. And I hope it's a perfect fit for you too. So, um, so with that, um, I just wanted to mention then a little bit about um, how I see that, what, I, what is my conclusion here of the gener generic role of universities. So yes, uh, of course we have the, mi the mission is um, 
if I start up there. The mission is, uh, is really not uh, too much to say about it. Every university in the world have more or less this education, research, outreach and innovation uh, as the mission. And of course, you have to define it a little more to understand the, the specifics, the uniqueness that we have. Education is, of course, uh, something that um, universities, higher education, something universities really wants to keep as its, uh, as its uh, um, you know, the asset that we have that we are not going to give away because we put a stamp on what is, uh, what is um, really uh, a, a teacher in academia. And so you, cannot, you have to go through university to become a teacher. And so, um, so here, the knowledge front, of course, we have to connect to and, and we have to be able to integrate knowledge today more than ever, because, of course, uh, it's not enough anymore to just be good in one discipline. You, you have to at least to have good friends in other disciplines. Mm. And, and the mindset shift is also something that we have to teach our students today, because we have to, they have to be able to understand how you build trust and how you, um, how you can put people outside of, their, of the comfort zone and how they can shift mindset on themselves and others, uh, because that's required in society. Universality I put in here, because that is also to see uh, all the, the world as equal. It's not discussed so much, but I think it will become more and more obvious that somebody has to foster that. And that's part of the sustainability as well, as you know. Leadership, I think, needs to go in much more in university education um, and because it's, uh, it's too late to do it afterwards. Lifelong learning is, of course, a d debate if uh, universities should take that leadership. But I think that uh, learning through the, your whole life is something that education, uh, higher education should be connected to um, in, uh, in, in some ways. Research, of course, curiosity-driven research is the, the uh, signum of universities. Um, of course, we have very good, is as good research going on in industries and, and, and other places, but uh, the curiosity driven is, uh, can of course also be need based. Mm. It doesn't have to be that you are totally isolated from the world to, to think freely, but because curiosity can be actually in many different forms, but it, it needs to be open and uh, you cannot control the thought. Mm. So this is what we try to, to develop even more. And a pure best, basic and need uh, inspired is, and applied, all them can be curiosity driven. Um, I was actually, uh, uh, do I go have ahead. to, go, okay. Go. Nope. I just wanted to say that um, when I worked at the um, Agency for Innovation in Sweden, we made a study to look at um, the, where we were giving research um, uh, to, um, money for un universities for research projects. They were very applied. They were um, you know, connected to, to in, uh, innovative areas and, and ideas. We found out that they, they created more basic research than the Basic Research Foundation, mm. which was very... I think it's a, uh, something to think about. Mm. That it's um, uh, and also the Nobel laureates usually have that connection when they found the new ideas. Mm -hmm. To go outside of your box is so important. So um, so then uh, the diverse roles then uh, down here that I think oh I, there we are. Um, so I think a university also needs to be able to, uh, to develop local clusters. What I mean by that is the public-private university partnerships in the local setting. And, and I think the best uh, is uh, when the, the local pub, uh, public sector, the mayor and others, uh, are, make a handshake on what, what are we going to develop in our local setting. And when that is said, and then the university and industry can, go, can join forces and build around that. Uh, local open education is, all, of course, also very important um, that uh, you, you connect with, with libraries and schools and, and so forth and, and open up education early as possible um, because the kids are ready. 
uh, national, uh, of course, uh, if I start with the global, the, the role globally is, uh, as I said, is a vat very natural role. There is where the knowledge forefront is. There is where universities need to be um, collaborative and not competitive. And there is where our stakeholder role really needs to be uh, outspoken. And we have to be visible and we have to be a respected partner for the society. So networking is, of course, a, a key word for how we network on all different levels. So I jumped over the national. Yeah, the national, I think it's, it's, um, not, it's not really, we don't really belong to the national level, but the national level is very, very important uh, for many ref different reasons, but mostly for the nation. Because if the nation has good universities, the nation will win on it, the people will gain on it. So transformation. Uh, is something that I think is also part of the sustainability goals, and uh, we have to we have to understand how to transform while we are doing research and education and outreach and innovation. But we also have to prepare um, this, the, our students to be able to do that in, in wherever they go in society. Now, the, the most important thing might even be to prepare the society for our students. I have several uh, interesting examples where the students were too well prepared and the society was not, and it's also not so very good. So we have to, that's why we, that's a, a, really a reason why we have to really collaborate with mm. university and, and the uh, outside world so that we prepare everybody. Uh, evolutionary, oh, lateral thinking. You might wonder what lateral think, thinking is. Yes. It's just to put a word that could fit in this box, actually. It needs an, a longer explanation. But, but it is really, the brain is, as you know, it really wants to focus. Um, and um, so, so the, the focused knowledge, um, when it co you combine it with the imaginary, imaginary knowledge, um, so that the objective and the subjective part of, society, of the mi mind is working together. That's lateral thinking, and that's something that is very important, becoming more important now, of course, with the digitalized world. Um, so um, ev evolutionary intersections means that the university, I, in my view, needs to really um, identify the, the unexplored spaces um, uh, in, in that is not where knowledge has not really been uh, explored. And, and make people come together and uh, into those spaces between disciplines, between stakeholders, and so forth. The public-private university partnership I already talked about, I think it's a very important uh, addition with the university involvement there that, the, as you know, public-private partnership has been uh, going on for some time. But I think when universities come in as, a, as an equal stakeholder, it will become something different. And I hope we can work on that um, in Japan. Um, characteristics then, uh, diversity and inclusion. Yes, diversity is um, a really important topic because that's how we are get, getting the creativity to boost. And it, But diver diversity needs to be in, Put together with inclusion, otherwise it's not going to be um, useful. So we have to, yeah, you understand what it means. Uh, public uh, and private and uh, public, public, private or public and private. Yeah, that I think is a discussion that I don't know how important it is actually. But of course, um, it, it's universities have can can be in different characteristics like that. And it shouldn't really matter, but it, it because it's, it tells us that university is something different. It's not public, it's not pri private, it's not public and private. It is actually university. Mm. So, uh, so then I just went into a little more uh, uh, deep dive here now. Jesper, you have to tell me when I have to stop. No, nope, uh, you keep so, going. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so I just put a little deeper uh, uh, dive into the into this university of 21st century, which I think we we all. I mean, it, not only the people in university, everybody needs to think about this because it, it's affect. Universities have to really step up and be part of the society in a much better way. Um, because uh, because of the challenges we have and opportunities we have in front of us. So uh, proactive and bottom-up in, in, in mission-driven strategic process. Um, 
no, uh, that I just have to reinforce proactive, not reactive. Okay, so uh, to have a clear role and visibility in education, research, outreach, innovation, clear, uh, easy to think, understand. Curiosity driven, I already talked about that. Um, uh, ability to establish trust before action. That is something that is uh, we have to think about all the time because we usually put uh, the projects and the money in too early. I think we have to take the time to build the trust and to, uh, to make everybody, um, you know, see the see each other and understand each other before we get to action. Um, if we want to have a long-term sustainable. Uh, relation. Uh, ability to, to unleash opportunities in the intersection of disciplines, I already talked about that. This ability is, doesn't come by itself. It really takes a lot of um, preparation and uh, in, internal incentives in the university set setting. Ability to, uh, to be transformative in collaboration. Yes, I talked about that too, that you have to understand how you help people to uh, to get out of the comfort zone, uh, to be uh, because otherwise they will not transform. They will just be linearly developing the, what their thoughts are. Uh, uh, a culture where diversity is inclusive and uh, release creativity. I talked about that. Uh, a culture where collaboration is multi-coupled. And here we, are, I'm, I didn't say anything about that. But multi-coupled, yes. When when university work with other stakeholders, because we are different. Uh, because we have different ways of uh, different driving, uh, d different drivers, and we also have different ways of of uh, how we internally work and uh, and control uh, our um, our institution. Uh, we have to be multi-coupled to be able to to work together. So usually, collaboration between university and uh, in industry, say has been based on, on projects. Mm -hmm. And you find, you, you know, it's hard. I know it myself. I worked with many pharmaceutical companies, and I had projects. I, they paid even 15 doc, uh, PhDs in my group. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how much work I did to get these precious collaborations going that could pay for that. So anyway, so, but, you know, that is not good, because the good thing is if I could connect to the boardroom of these companies, that they could say that, hey, you, your projects need to be more exploratory. Mm -hmm. We give you the power to do with this co collaboration to really uh, take us to where we need to be as an industry tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that in a project by when you connect in the middle of an industry and the middle management. They are not allowed to do these type of things. So, if but if you have the blessing from above and you have the action in the middle and you have the uh, the really the uh, the outgoing fo uh, force in the in also included the students and everybody, then the multi-coupled can really make a huge difference. I promise. Uh, so, um, a culture of lateral thinking is um, the combined logic and imagination. I wanted to repeat that because it's very crucial. Um, uh, a preferred partner, um, of course, in the public-private is not somebody you invite late in um, because we don't have money. We are not the ones that are deciding. Well, if you calculate how much money it, it has cost to, to make a professor to come to a level where, with knowledge they are today, mm. Uh, that's lots of money. So we are actually our in kind is a is a high value in the collaboration. Shared uh, governance for incentives and in education. I think shared governance is something that uh, we should talk about. I think it's uh, to really um, in 360 degree type of discussions all the time for for um, um, to to really develop the a university's internal environment. Visibility and respect uh, uh, brand, uh, and we have to really have a brand that functions locally, nationally, and internationally. Now I'm talking very much. I know. I know this. I'm going to go faster. Yeah. Uh, Keep the pace is good. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so, okay. So I, I also wanted to put a little uh, thing here in on, on on the gender gap situation because it's um, it is uh, a discussion. Uh, that is going on all over the world, of course, but all, uh, specifically here in Japan, I've heard a lot of these discussions. So, um, 
so in higher education, yes, we uh, um, it is uh, something that we have to think of. Uh, a gender gap is uh, can threaten uh, the nation, uh, I would say, because if we don't release the diversity um, that we have in uh, in different ways, in the, then we will lose out on creativity, and the nation will fail on that, of course. Uh, because uh, that's uh, yeah, that's obvious. Uh, a gender gap is uh, is visible at higher uh, career positions, uh, but it is not. It's caused in other places. It's caused much earlier. So you cannot solve it there um, in that where you see it. You have to solve it where it's created, and it's created very much in the family structure. Uh, of uh, traditional roles and um, um, the difference in salary is a really bad uh, problem because if you have difference in salary you cannot really release the, uh, that uh, the parents have equal you know can can be incentivized to be equal parents to their kids and so forth uh, in Sweden you ha they have solved more or less that problem so that mm. you can see in the university setting that um, uh, both male and female are really talking in the same way about having time with the kids and, and helping each other and so forth. It's not a really um, a, a discussion there at mm. what it is here. So, so I think the difference in salary is the key mm. because if you have that, then you can open up a lot of possibilities. Um, and uh, of course... Um, the unfavored gender, and now it may be in our case, it's females in this science engineering setting. Um, they, if they, the ones that come into this environment, they often get a lot of um, uh, time-consuming roles that they have to be part. But you have to have a female in each um, group and, and uh, meeting and so forth, and that really destroys their opportunities. Um, I also think it's very important to have, this is my opinion now, that when you uh, select um, and, and change this, an uh, unfavored and dominant gender needs to be selected the same quality criteria. Uh, because if you are not doing that, if you select females to get up the numbers quickly and you set a special program for that, these poor females can never get rid of that stamp. Mm -hmm. And I have seen it in practice, and, and it's really sad because it's, um, it's not what we want. Um, so, um, yeah, and also it's very important, I think, for everybody to think, men, men in our case now, to think that the, all the social team building that you have, mm -hmm. you have to include the women because that's something that I experienced in my life. I was, when I go to, very, to conferences and, you know, the men usually they gathered in, in after in the evenings and so forth in bars and what have you, and and you know uh, it was difficult to to really get. But you have to be invited mm -hmm. to be um, to get into this, this situation. So I think it's very social team building very important. Um, diversity is um, essential for education research innovation, and. Um, um, yeah, so gender equality, we have to do something. And of course, we're going to try to do something really in, in OS. But I think it's important to, to focus on all of the diversity um, character, mm -hmm. because this is what universities are all about, the diversity. And we have to really um, get that whole picture uh, to, to be uh, in a better shape so that we can get creativity out of it. Um, so... Let's see what I have more for you here. Um, yeah, I put up some important questions. Now I don't have time. If we don't have time for this, I can jump go, in. No, no, go, go ahead. Uh, go okay. Ahead. Uh, okay. So here I just these are some uh, questions uh, for thought. Okay. So I just uh, pick some here. So the first one here. Uh, so what have pandemic, drone technology, and AI taught us so far? Are we sure that people have understood in the pandemic case? Have they understood that mRNA research started in the 60s? And it was, you know, a, the ability to really connect M mRNA in the cells in the 70s. I mean, this is a whole lifetime of research going behind that we got the vaccines in a few months. 
And so if people don't understand how, how important it was for all, all of us that that research, that open research was going on for, you know, a whole lifetime without understanding how important it would be that we had it mm. exactly at those months when we needed to, to really boost it up. So it was not, not, it was not something that was just came from a, a, a sudden research uh, laboratory. So I think that's very important because that means that, and I don't think that many people think about this. I don't think many people know about it, mm -hmm. but we have to all help each other to un so because this is an an experience we have right now that we'll think about if we didn't have that research going, what where would we be today? Mm -hmm. We all have lost a lot of uh, friends and and relatives, so forth, and it's terrible to think about. So drone technology, drone technology was, you know, developed more like a game. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but I have seen it firsthand how it really changed war. Mm. And it is so scary when I saw our students at AUA to not prepared to go out and not in the front line of the war. You know, they were not, they didn't put them in the front. They put them on the third line. But you know, 18 year old boys, they had just started high, uh, university, put up in the forest in the third line. They could not, they told me the ones that survived, they told me they couldn't even move a thing. They, could, they had to stand ex, uh, still because they saw if a friend of theirs were moving an arm, the drone was kicking him out. Mm. So this is, I think it's just to make you aware of, of this, Told us, and everybody was taking this by, as a shock because this has not been part of the the war game, if you want. So I think we have to be so aware, much more aware of where technology is taking us to places where we have not really planned and we cannot, mm. we're not prepared. AI is, of course, also very much discussed these days, and some people are really thinking that that AI will also take over that um, um, imaginary part of the brain. Um, well, we, I, don't, I don't think that we have to solve that today, but it's a, it's a thought that, uh, you know, how far will it go? Um, and what threats does it take? And how much do we prepare? One important question, how much do we have to prepare our students so that they don't get trapped in just thinking um, narrow in this field. Mm. Um, okay, so can I take, pick another one here? Do you have an idea, Jasper? Which one do you want to pick? Do pick, uh, pick, take your pick. <laughs> um, uh, well, um, yeah, I can take the bottom one on the left. So, uh, what do Scandinavian statistics tell us when basic research has doubled in industry over the last five years? It was a study made um, mm. and uh, recently presented, and and we were pretty amazed about this this fact, and uh, and also that it has increased faster the rate than applied research in the industries, and and this uh, could could mean that there is an, a really awareness of survival in the at least the Swedish industries, that in order for for to be part of the future you have to also connect to basic research. Mm. Of course, industries may, may not have, um, uh, can, cannot do it by themselves. At least they can do it much better if they do it with the university mm. in close relation. So I think this is uh, actually an opportunity for us to really take this, to find how we could work better so that we are each uh, stakeholder can uh, develop um, uh, according to its mission. The, the top right, how important huh? is it that higher education gives students understand objective versus subjective ability? What, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean that, well, we, science and technology, for some strange reason, I've studied this actually in Sweden, because in Sweden for 200 years ago, there were, the engineers were really um, strong and developed companies that you might, surprisingly, they survived. They live today also, SKF, yep. ABB, Ericsson and you know companies like that they started there at the same time by engineers and you know what was the difference with the between these engineers and what we have today 
because it was that engineering was standing on the legs of, of science, technology, and humanity. Mm. That these three legs were equally important in their education. Mm. Mm. So what happened? Where did we lose the hum humanity? Mm. Where did, when did engineering become science and technology only? Mm. I, I don't know. It's a mystery. Um, and and this, it's not so that we just can today merge it mm. because we have to prepare everybody for to see each other. But I think that is actually a key of, of course, we talk about STEM and STEM plus A, so that we should have arts and humanity connected. Mm. But it's more words than mm. reality. So I think that is uh, crucial because if um, if we don't, and of course today subjectivity also is con is considered that uh, you know humans that uh, the human part that you cannot trust mm. computers you can trust everything you put in it's they're not going to do anything beyond that is it true i don't know <laughs> i think i think my take on this is that well wait a minute why can't we start to develop uh, people that you can trust also Maybe so that's a good idea. Yep. We need a little bit of HI, human intelligence. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Anybody else has a, a wants to talk about anything? Yeah, or should I move on? Yep, move on. I move on. Uh, oh, so here, uh, talking about 200 years ago, here's Louis Pasteur, who you know maybe what he did. And while well, talking about vaccines, he was uh, actually one that figure that we could make vaccines. And, um, and he did a lot of uh, work from in France in that time. Well, he said some good things also, because you know that first sentence that often people uh, refer to, as science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity, okay? It's a torch which illuminated the world. This is not nice, really, isn't it? But the second sentence is very much more relevant for especially where we are uh, thinking about today. So uh, science is the highest personification of the nation because the nation will remain the first, which carries the furthest with the works of thoughts and intelligence. So the nations that can really foster their universities in the best way, they will be the leaders. And he thought about that like in the mid 1800. Mm. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, so looking to the future of OIST, maybe you wonder what I think about that. Of course, we, we know that we have um, the strengths. It's a 10 year young university. It's, it's really, I have to say that Japan has done something amazing to be able to in 10 years to be uh, to really deliver something that is at the level where it is today but doesn't mean that it can just stay and uh, relax because this is of course um, and still very small it's still very young it has to it has done the right thing so far and so now we have to really and I'm not saying that only the people at OIS I think all of us I think this is an investment for Japan in Japan mm. and for Japan in the world. So let's look at it like that. It's not going to stick out and be alone. And that's not the purpose. The purpose is to really try to, uh, to, to help. We have to help each other to get the best practice that can spread in the country to really help the country to be more, you know, to be a preferred partner. Um, so um, I'm, I don't have to go through the strengths because you probably you can read them and you know them. So opportunities. So opportunities that I think we can do from the position we have in a strong research and education is that we could uh, develop further on, uh, on connection to the outside world. And, and test beds uh, uh, is, is, of course, a possibility that we can... Um, develop further. What does it mean with test beds? It, it means that today, um, as I alluded to before, industries and society are uh, transforming into a more sustainable solutions, which where you have to be if, to be competitive. 
it means that we can no longer have that each industry is, um, is just protecting everything and have their own plugs in the wall, if you want, their own solutions on, on everything to keep, to keep uh, the, the customers uh, you know, in, in, in their uh, control. No, that doesn't work anymore because the, uh, the world will change so much. So what, what industries have to do is, of course, to be brave and open up and, uh, and really work together to set new standards for the sustainable world. And on top of that, the competition needs to come in. So you need to kind of, mm. kind of re reset where competition is going on and not too, um, too simplified. Mm. And I think that's the ones that will do it. And, and I think if you want to, if you want to survive, you have to do it because the only the ones that won't do that will be the uh, the competitive ones in the future. It was surprising also that in in the European Union that, that I kind of worked uh, on and off, and there they, there's quite few examples of um, you know su suggestions for setting new standards. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I read that as this is an opportunity. If people are not doing it so much, it means that we can do it and we can take advantage of it. Mm. So entrepreneurial and uh, entrepreneurial and leadership skills with a positive innovation climate. I think it's very important that university, I hope to talk with other universities in Japan, if we could come to some kind of agreement, what is the generic part of what universe, what our universities would like to to do in the entrepreneurial and uh, innovation area. And what does it mean that we will also educate our students? Uh, because um, entrepreneurship, I see it as two very different uh, components. One is, of course, the invention that will become an innovation. Uh, the other part, which is equally important, is uh, the people that are entrepreneurs. They have to really um, develop and understand and train that. That's a skill that uh, is not comes with your um, mm. genes. It's 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 a training, and and it really means that you also need to have your understand your personal preferences, how you really mm. uh, can connect good teams, and how you change teams and so forth. I think that is something that we need to in, include more in the university. But f m most of all, I think it's important that. In the innovation process will never happen in the university as such. Mm. It will never happen outside of the universe. So we have to kind of find uh, how, how much of it that we would take responsibility for and how we work together with the other stakeholders. Mm. Um, so uh, Okinawa uh, could gain from becoming a two language island, I write here. I don't know if, how many of you uh, agree with me, but it has. I think whole Japan would gain on that to see Okinawa as a test bed for two languages. Now, I have been told immediately that, no, you're wrong, Karin, this has to be three languages, because we already have two Japanese languages there. So, so, so well, that's OK. Um, we also so have- So you want to introduce Swedish? <laughs> yeah, Swedish or uh, Greek. I thought. Greek. Oh, but there you go. Now we're going back. To the no, Western but uh, but to be um, you know, not only I mean now for the tourism also is is makes sense. Of course, we can see try to see that uh, you know the the painful history actually gave us something good. It gave us a little bit of English language in the country and in the island, and and so that's a good start. And we, why don't take advantage of that? And, and really, because that could really help also to attract um, uh, companies, to attract um, business, mm. to also make our students that would like, not more than anything else, they like to stay in Japan that they started to love. Mm. They come from different parts of the world. And if we could help them to kind of get a job also mm. and stay on, and that could, I think we have nothing to lose. Mm. But I might uh, not know everything that I need to yet. I have only been here for a few weeks, so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, okay, challenge of low-paid jobs uh, 
could become a driver. So I, you know, my husband, he, you, you met my husband. Yeah, he's, he, he tells that uh, I always see, he, he has a problem with that. I always see every problem. I search problems to turn them into something positive. I don't know if that's a problem by itself, but but I but you know what's what I know what I learned in my life is that when things are a little bit chaotic or problematic, that's when you can make a change. So uh, so that's maybe why I I look because here of course the low pay jobs we have and and uh, um, in in Okinawa and the the different types of. Um, um, the, the work, the work uh, la labor market there, um, to really to um, to take it to another level, to, or to add another level, I would say, because these jobs are very important as well. But that could I could compare a little bit what I saw in Armenia that uh, that the most uh, ambitious young people were the ones that came from the rural part of the country, and the parents were applauding it. They were helping and supporting. Uh, so I think that you know all the the young people all over the world are equally um, you know able mm. to to move on in different and, uh, and really be part of society and change of society, but uh, but the ones that have grown up in really um, you know difficult conditions or unfavored conditions, they have that drive, right. and um, their parents have that drive, and but the ones that you know, live in a really everything. Go, you can buy it in the in a store. They they tend to become a little spoiled. Okay, so <laughs> no. You're referring to Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> you know well. <laughs> so um, so I, so I think that um, that that these uh, these are things that we could um, yeah develop and take advantage of. So uh, that might have been yeah. That was my last slide. No. So. Yeah, so. So, so uh, Karin, fantastic. I mean, thank you, thank you so much for an overview. And, and, and again, you were very bold uh, because literally arriving uh, in Japan, um, you know, just about three or four weeks ago, uh, being hit by typhoon um, and, you know, basically literally like in, in week one, uh, sort of presenting yourself, I think that's very good. Uh, but I think, um, you know, it's a testimony to, um, you know, Asia society and OIST um, sort of really wanting to collaborate um, and, uh, you know, wanting to learn uh, from each other. I would like to sort of focus in on sort of one area because your experience, um, you know, sort of in Europe, uh, in the United States and now, you know, Japan, uh, but if for sort of one insight, if you look at the American higher education system, right, mm -hmm. it's all about money. It's a big business, right? Uh, it's a very well honed, um, you know, high performance machine. Um, while Europe is sort of a little bit more of a hybrid, right? But I'd love to get your insights and, you know, sort of your sort of initial thoughts on what maybe Japan can learn from the European experience and from the American experience? Yeah, very good, very good question. Because the, these, uh, the, the difference you point at is really a difference. And uh, it's, um, um, you know, I, th I would say that in, in Europe there is one challenge, and I see it um, maybe in, 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 in the northern part more, but, I, I, but you know, really that to get um, the to get really people to want to educate themselves. Mm. That's really a, a question. And also the universities have, you know, in their, um, with their, that type of politics you have in Europe that, oh, we have to educate everybody. Now every, more, more than 50% have, have to go through higher education. And so that kind of um, puts it in, the, it kind of hurts the university's ability to be, you know, to to develop its um, its character, mm. um, you know. So there's good and bad sides in it. But of course, in the United States, you could say that it's even worse because there, um, you know, you have to pay a fortune to get your kids through education, and the education is not really focused either uh, on uh, really what do the students need to learn mm. either. So, so I'm wondering if 
if any of those could be <laughs> benchmarks, really, not fully. But maybe we, we have to, uh, to pick from, uh, from both. But also, I think what, what I would suggest is that we have to look at where do, where do universities have to be mm. um, in the next uh, decades. Because I think that Japan has advantages that both Europe and, and US doesn't have. Mm. Uh, this what I know that all the people in Europe talk about is how can we how can we be so long term thinking as Japan is in our um, uh, government. I, I remember so well that they talked in Swedish government about oh here in Sweden we can only the only thing we can talk long term about is retirement. So it's terrible. And so you, there are so many other things that are important long term. No. Uh, sustainability, one of them. So, of course, sustainability in a, in a, you know, in a, not like small num, not like numbers or just you pick this uh, piece of the cake or no, just to take it into a real um, pos a real challenge that would uh, transform, mm, mm. because to to transform together. And I believe that if we could find a way that universities and industries are talking together mm. and and they they should find each other in the global world because we both are there and then um, um with that uh, challenge challenges that we can come up to we, up with we present to the political mm. world mm. because i think that um i think that most um, nations and the politicians understand that that would really make them uh, mm -hmm. move forward. And, but, but what happens today also in, in Europe, it's a, the bilateral discussion between politicians and industry and between politicians and university. And those bilateral discussions mm -hmm. never will touch mm -hmm. uh, what really is needed to be competitive as a country. Right. Right. Was that an answer? That was a that was a very you know <laughs> yes <laughs> you know I don't know what do you guys think you know I I mean I'm uh, sorry uh, that one one other thing you you said something at the outset or, or pretty early on that, that 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 got me sort of a little bit puzzled you sort of said that you know sometimes the societies are not ready for the university graduates. Oh yeah. And, uh, and, yes. and you said you had some specific examples there. Oh, so yeah. you were, I think that would be you know what what, what did you mean by that? Well, I was, you know, uh, really kind of, in a way, naive when I um, started to uh, at Chalmers because I had so many ideas I wanted to uh, to put in uh, in action in the university that I thought this is going to be really great. So we uh, we started to co connect uh, architecture, the area of architecture, with built environment, mm -hmm. and we pres we made courses that uh, in the students were prepared. They and we also gave them design thinking. Yeah, you can see where we're going here. So the students became really, um, you know, understand how to really connect the architectural with the science technology, and then they were also transformative. Okay, so then uh, they were happy. There was a really active, uh, active uh, group cohort of students. They graduated. They got jobs easy, you know, very good jobs in the big firms and so forth, and then. I got. I went. To, I was proud. So I went to Stockholm. We had a, a conference on uh, architecture and everything. And they were so upset at me. They were chewed me out. These art firms. Because, what did I do to the students? They were. They had so many ideas, and they are so. Uh, they want to change everything, and we are not. We, they have to come into our business, and we have to teach them the culture, and and on and on and. And so they should not, you know, they should, you know, not learn so much at university. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, then it was not, it didn't end there. Because then at the university, the students started to come back, they alumni. And they were also upset, you know, that why didn't you tell us that we're going to have these problems when we get out in the workforce? Mm. So, so that was, uh, you know, from two sides, I really got that. Um, and that was luckily very early on in, uh, so, so that was uh, an eye opener that we could start, how should we now work and prepare mm. the society? Mm. So that's how all these examples that I worked on later, that actually had, uh, was, was very, yeah, and then I can tell you one more thing there, because then, 
when I, I th we thought out of this multi-couple collaboration, because industries, as you might know, they ha they're working very well with portfolios of projects mm. internally. So I thought, well, let's take that um, model and then we work, because that means that we can have a process at the same time projects. Mm. And that means that we could actually in enter in different ways. Right. With different cultures and we can boost our different cultures okay so okay so we meet every six months and and uh, compare notes with the top level okay so fine so then i thought oh we have all these swedish companies we have so many companies in sweden i could just this is going to be great and nobody wanted to do this with us mm. so it was uh, i didn't get any any but then suddenly some german company came and said hey wait a minute this is something that we would like to try mm. so i started actually with a german company uh, eon as an, an energy company and they they gained so much i mean in in a, just a few months they could take 40 years research that we had in mm. the lab and turn it into an a, you know, say million dollar mm. gain mm. Mm. for their company. They didn't have to change the infrastructure even. Mm. Mm. And so, and they went out public with that because I had also made a deal that everything we do has to be open in the public. Mm. They didn't want to do that, but we had... It's a German thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so but I forced them. Uh, I forced them. So I, I learned how to work with lawyers now. But... <laughs> But so so anyway so so that they uh, they published that and you know everybody then wanted to work like that so I think it's um, uh, yeah these are two examples but but these are like exactly I think you know where many of us who are sort of at the periphery or or involved in in in, in Japanese education I mean you know sort of Japanese are very good at sort of putting things into boxes putting things into silos and making sure that there's no communication and everybody's very proud of uh, preserving their own little territory. You mentioned, um, you know, in you... I think you should be proud and, and uh, you know, that I'm not... We shouldn't take away the proudness. No, no, we should uh, never, never take away the pride, you know. Um, well, a little bit, I think. <laughs> but... Um, little humbleness, I think, uh, you could go a long way. But, um, you know, in all seriousness, you mentioned uh, the experience at the Danish uh, Technical University, mm. uh, that they completely changed uh, their structure uh, by reorganizing the mm. institutes, if I understand you correctly. Research institutes. Research institutes and integrating them into the university. I mean, that's exactly the sort of Haikaku, the, exactly the sort of reform that uh, yeah, it's, you know could, could be potentially quite quite attractive yeah. to Japanese. But tell us a, a little bit more about that. Oh, I think so you said crazy. Yeah, it's it, it is because it's uh, it's very difficult. It's also two different cultures, really. And and then you suddenly you have more or less the whole innovation in your hands in the university. So you have to and and is you have also a market driven component. Mm. It, together with something that definitely is But was it the clear. researchers who resisted most? Was it what? What was it? The the admin part? I mean, what was? What? No, no. It was. A, it was. A, you know, the, the, there's no Danish politician in there. <laughs> no, but the Danish politicians they are doing things kind of brave. You can say mm. um, they have such. They have also had very much luck in these kind of things they do but it's really crazy because it really shocks everybody so yeah. then you just have to take care of the, what the situation is so um that yeah i i could talk hours about that but i'm not going to do that and so um but if you're interested in <laughs> uh, you no, but you mentioned but the net outcome has been very positive yes because then um because yeah the, it's a reality you have to deal with it mm. and try to do something good and that's what they you know they really put all their minds into finding how could we now en enlarge the uh, the the outreach and the uh, innovation responsibility of the university yeah um and of course, as I also mentioned a bit, that the, it, Denmark is helped by the fact that they have these foundations mm. with tax reductions, mm. like Novo Nordic and so forth. And so that is something that the that, uh, national level has done there, that industries can put very favorable foundations in place for research. Right, right. We don't have that in Sweden. So in Sweden, they did another thing. They took the, the research institutes mm. 
uh, they had exactly the same situation before. But then the research institute in Sweden, they were put in one national research institute. Mm. And then they tried to put incentives for them to work with the, with the universities. Mm -hmm. Not so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it's long term, I think da the Danish model was better. But mm -hmm. it's maybe because it's a small country also. You, you have to, everything we do is also related to how, if we have any kind of domestic customers mm -hmm. or if you want. Right. Well, uh, stakeholders, right? Stakeholders and customers. Because Denmark has very, it's a very small country. You can, in, in this definition, if we are domestic or, um, you know, have to live in the global world, in that definition, Sweden is a small country. Mm -hmm. Because we have to, every company has to sell outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if, I think I like that definition because it really means how it really affects how you have to work. Right. Thank you very much for the wide-ranging discussion. I'm glad you put the last slide up there explaining what OIST is. I actually don't know much about the OIST. I didn't realize it's only 10 years old. Um, there, are, it's good to see the strengths and some of the aspirations and the goals and so forth. But let me ask somewhat of a provocative question as a uh, richly experienced geographically, academically, professionally, educational technocrat and academic. Uh, you've been all over the world. Japan seems to have a major problem with its major universities. Its rankings based on global rankings continue to fall, continue to go south. Is that a problem really when you look outside at how wonderful a place Japan is to live, its infrastructure works, its society is civil, there are not guns on the streets, there are crazies like anywhere. Or is that a problem with the global rankings? Are they flawed? Are they too um, centric to the uh, types of universities that are running these databases and so-called global mm -hmm. rankings? And within that broader context, what do you see the role of OIST and how is it going to contribute to the discussion here of the Mm. the rankings of Japanese mm. universities, the broader educational system mm. at the university level. Mm. And the last question is a very niche type question. Does OIST have a humanities section or humanities discipline, or is it all about science okay. and technology? Oh, very good question. So it's wide ranging, but mm. uh, I think it would be good to hear some yeah. of your comments about the broader ecosystem within which you've come to and arrived. Yeah, um, yes, with this uh, last thing you say about uh, con if we have humanities, with, because what I said, we, we should, uh, shouldn't we? But, but also, um, this relates to an, uh, a question that I want to touch upon first then, because um, how big should, uh, or is it small today? If we have uh, around 90 um, principal investigators, strong scientists and each one has you know a group around them so about uh, say a thousand people that are uh, actually engaged in research in different ways but but it's small because it's uh, it's usually um, uh, a university usually has um, at least double of that or and more so so the question is and we are on a remote island so, of course, that also uh, doesn't help to integrate and, and, and grow that way. But, uh, but uh, because universities are global, uh, then, of course, there is, if we are able to really, with each, have very strong scientists, and they have very strong networks in the, with the best uh, groups in the world, you know, there is nothing that hinders us from be, becoming, uh, to act as a big one, even though we are not too big. So I think that um, uh, that component can really um, uh, be used and developed. And in doing so, we can connect to humanity. We don't have to have everything, you, uh, medicine and different things. That we, if we have that in a smart way connected to other Japanese universities and in the world, then we, everybody will gain on that. So, so that is my answer to that last but of course we will connect both to medicine and humanity more and i'm going to talk to universities in japan about that uh, so um so then the ranking yes ranking is a, a very tricky thing because it's something that everybody hates and loves at the same time and and 
fortunately everybody's using it too <laughs> so uh, so but um, at the time I, I was very active uh, with other universities um, in a uh, in, in European Union and we tried to make actually we made a new ranking system it's called multi-rank and I think it's finally has started to be used it was many many years it wasn't used at all because the, you know the reason it wasn't used was that it was telling the truth Ah, so nobody wanted to have that. So, so that was, um, they said it was too complicated and that. But, but it's not really, it's, it was telling the truth. And now it's starting to come. It might, and that's going to be a blessing because then it also shows a little bit, you have to decide as a university, what, where do you want to be good? What do you want to stick out with, you know, so that you could actually choose that and that measures your, your preferences. And so... I think that's great because then you can also complement with others and so forth. So, uh, but uh, rank and, and now what we can do, what we can do as universities and what we did at Chalmers was that we selected um, rankings that we liked. Not that they gave us good results. No, that we liked that the ranking that ranked us on our um, culture are what we would like to be so that we could have it as a driving force for ourselves. We wanted to have more international students, so we ranked in that international student ranking, and so we could see how we and uh, so make it into a KPI if you want. Um, so that's possible to do because there are different type of rankings of all different things that you, we can choose and 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 use as a tool. Uh, but then, of course, in the end of the day, everybody's using times and so forth, and that and that is always favoring the big and the uh, old uh, universities so um, so and you you can shift like company like uh, universities uh, that uh, the japanese ones you say that they fall in this ranking yes of course i mean it's not maybe they're not fall maybe others are going up uh, so i think that's probably what it is and and of course there are things that uh, that could be improved and maybe that's how we should try to in a good way look at the situation to try to see what can we do that we anyway want to do that would help us to move up in this rankings and and there are many things definitely also in in the very good sides of traditions we have every tradition has good and bad things so we should dare to look at that I think and and uh, it's not so difficult to to really find some some things that could be improved. And I think first of all, to really uh, not try to become like the others, try to be the model for the future. I think that's the first thing. And and I think that Japan should really, because I hear that a lot in in Sweden. And the Swedish uh, companies tell me that, oh, you're going to Japan, that's great. Because we are, that's the only country we could really, we hope for to really connect with us in, uh, in Asia. This is Japan. Japan has, is big enough. It has, you know, a lot of uh, characters that we like. And also we have a good um, history of working together. So I think it's, um, we, I think Japan has so many good things that, should lift up and really, uh, develop, uh, you know, visualize. Uh, like I said before, the, to really that, to be able to have a long-term uh, thinking and from the national level is so unique today. And don't lose that. So it's interesting. You're, you're very humble uh, as a board member of OIST. Um, OIST is actually ranked consistently in the top 10, um, you know, on the Nature Index, which adjusts for size of researchers. Um, and the genesis of OIST uh, was exactly this idea that Japan needs a catalyst, right? Um, you know, and the collaborations, um, you know, from the very international community and the very collaborative and interdisciplinary community that uh, OIST has, uh, you know, the 
interactions with Japanese top uni research universities to step up, uh, you know, collaborations there and thereby uh, get out of Shimaguni Kozo, get outside of Japan and get the researchers, um, the Japanese uh, uh, researchers, uh, as well as the uh, postdocs, as well as the doctoral students that exchange pulse and metabolism, right, uh, you know, is one of the big, um, you know, uh, tasks that OIST uh, is mandated to do. And, you know, with your leadership, uh, I'm sure it's going to prosper um, and, uh, and deliver on that here. We've got one more question. Takehito from Sofia University. My question is academic leadership from your perspective. Many Japanese universities have chairs, academic deans, or provosts. They are Japanese people because of they don't move to another institution. They are internally promoted, including president. If individually they want to be connected to the OIS leaders or leaders, Uppsala University, or Swedish University, and construct trusted, leaders, uh, trusted uh, relationship in the long run, what kind of component will be important for Japanese leaders to communicate effectively with non-Japanese leaders around the world? Thank you. Well, well, definitely this, uh, what you're pointing at, to, um, to have mobility in your career um, between universities, it's a must in most countries. Um, and that's an easy, should be not so hard to do, actually, if we, if we put that as a, as a priority. Because um, there's, um, it, it, would, it would really help a lot. And, uh, and it, it also is very hard when you lose good people from a university. But you know that uh, you also will, uh, you know, the whole mobility is, uh, is, has so many positive uh, things that comes with it, and you um, you will break a lot of spells by doing that. So I re I really think, what what level should uh, the mobility be first broken? May maybe of course the president level, yeah, sure. Um, and um, but also I think it's it's really important after the PhD. Um, it's important also to to really prepare the PhD for a. Uh, a career um, by themselves during the PhD studies. So that to, to support, uh, the, to make, uh, you know, the, the, collect, the cohort uh, more diverse uh, and uh, take responsibility. Karen, this was very, very good, uh, very enthusiastic. You're very passionate uh, about what it is that you do. And, um, you know, from the Asia Society's perspective, um, you know, we very much look forward um, to a continued good and strong relationship. Um, also... Um, may, may I say one more thing before you say also? Of course. Because I, I forgot to say one thing that I really wanted to say, and that is for everybody to help to get a culture that hires PhDs. Good. Thank you. For everybody. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um